To begin with, we'd like to ask the question, what is higher criticism and how does it relate to what is called lower criticism? So the discipline of biblical studies is called higher criticism uh, in order to correlate it with lower criticism. Lower criticism is, uh, concerns itself with the text of the Hebrew scriptures, and so it is also called textual criticism quite frequently. Although there was a single original copy of each book of the Old Testament when it was originally written, variant readings have made their way into the manuscripts that we have today because scribes have made mistakes while copying each book by hand. Lower criticism is the study of these various manuscripts in order to understand where scribes made their mistakes and if possible, to recover the oldest form of the text in order to approach the original text more closely. On the other hand, higher criticism is not directly concerned with the form of the text, although most of the higher critics' judgments are based on the work of lower critics. Rather, higher criticism focuses on the questions surrounding the literary character of the books, such as the background and the composition of the text. Who wrote it? Why did they write it? Was the original text written by multiple authors, or was it edited by another hand after the first was finished with it? And is this text an accurate reflection of history? Now, the study of these questions is not necessarily destructive to the biblical view of God's inspiration and revelation in his word. Every one of these questions and all of the other questions that higher critics ask can be answered in a way that preserves the inspiration and in inerrancy of the Bible. However, from the beginning, the field of higher criticism has been filled with theories that are destructive toward the unity of the Bible. While the details of these theories have ebbed and flowed as archaeological discoveries and other types of research have challenged and outright defeated their presuppositions, these theories still enjoy a large degree of influence in the world of biblical scholarship today. Our hope today is to briefly outline two of the most influential theories and then to explain their influence on certain fields of modern scholarship. First, we'll take a look at the documentary hypothesis of the 18th and 19th centuries. Attacks against the authenticity of the Bible have been made since its composition. However, the work of French doctor Jean Astruc in the first half of the 18th century marked a significant transition in the development of Old Testament study by introducing what is called source criticism. Now, Astruc was aware of several attacks against the book of Genesis in particular. These critics claimed that the interchange or the use of multiple names for God, in particular the name Yahweh, which is usually translated as Lord or Jehovah in modern Bibles, and the name Elohim, which is usually just translated as God. Uh, Astruc heard several criticisms that suggested that the use of these two names in the book of Genesis indicated that at least two different authors had written the book, one who knew God as Yahweh and another who knew God as Elohim. Astruc set out to defend Moses and defend Moses' role in revealing God's creation to the children of Israel, but in his own mind, he could not see any way out of these critical attacks. He was fully convinced of the legitimacy of these arguments. So instead, he chose to adopt these, these theories or these hypotheses and simply modified his perspective of Moses. What if these two authors did exist, he asked, but they wrote before Moses lived? Then Moses could have a copy of each of their, their books, each of their documents in front of him, when he sat down to write the book of Genesis. When the two documents seemed to differ, Moses either made a mistake by following one instead of the other, or he intentionally included the two sources uh, plainly alongside each other with no editing in order to make sure that the right version got in. Consequently, he said that Genesis was a narrative stitched together from at least two incompatible sources. But what mattered to Astruc was that Moses was the one who stitched them together and edited them, 
and so it had authority because a prophet of God had done this work. He thought that this theory would satisfy the, the accusations of the critics without harming the faith of believers who believed that Moses did reveal the word of God. Toward the end of the 18th century, a Strzok's theory was adopted and expanded in Germany by, the scholar, by a scholar by the name of Johann Gottfried Eichhorn. Eichhorn and his followers over the next hundred years or so began to find more and more indications, or so they believed, of fragmentary sources throughout the rest of the Pentateuch and through the entire Old Testament. These documents were identified using subjective criteria, so there was little unity among the German higher critics of this period, but they all agreed on the fundamental conception of the, the Hebrew Bible that every book of the Old Testament was stitched together from a variety of old contradictory documents that an editor had tried to harmonize in order to idealize the history of Israelite religion. Now in the midst of this turmoil where every individual scholar who was working on this, this problem that they, they believed to, that they had identified, uh, in the midst of all of this turmoil, a scholar named Carl Heinrich Graf, yeah, oh, I missed the slide, okay. A scholar named Carl Heinrich Graf set forward his proposed reconstruction of the history of the Old Testament. At the time, his idea was simply one of the many reconstructions of the Old Testament available in German literature, but it caught the attention of a successor in the, the next generation whose power and influence in the field far exceeded what Graf had ever enjoyed, Julius Wellhausen. Wellhausen adopted Graf's hypothesis with a few modifications, and he spread it far and wide. And it was this form of the theory that finally crossed the language barrier out of the German language and into the English-speaking world, primarily through the work of S.R. Driver, Francis Brown, and C.A. Briggs, as well as many other scholars of the same period. The most influential form of this theory is often presented as the JEDP theory. And each of these four letters represents the four primary documents or layers in the development of the Pentateuch. These documents are supposed to interact with Hebrew history as follows. Wilhausen taught that the nation of Israel began as a polytheistic nation just like all other Canaanite nations, and they had no conception of a single ruling god to the exclusion of all other gods. Over time, the influence of a particular deity named Yahweh or Elohim, and Wilhausen believed that the difference in the name uh, was either a geographic or a dialectic difference, this particular deity grew to become the dominant religion in Israel and in Judah. During the 400 years between the reign of David over Israel and that of King Josiah in Judah, the J and E documents, the Yahwist or Jehovist and Elohistic documents, were written in order to interpret the history of the world and the history of the Israelite nation according to this new developing religious perspective. Together, these documents contained the narrative portions of the Pentateuch along with the books of Joshua through Ruth. During the reign of Josiah, then, the priests of Yahweh in Jerusalem determined to bring an end to the worship of other gods. They wrote the book of Deuteronomy, a legal code demanding that all the people of Israel and Judah worship Yahweh alone in the temple in Jerusalem, and then, through a conspiracy, they found this book hidden in the temple so that the people would really believe that it was written by Moses, who had been dead for some 800 years. This is the document they refer to as the D document or De Deuteronomistic document. Shortly after Josiah's reign, the children of Israel were taken into captivity in Babylon, but all three of these documents had found enough traction to survive this catastrophe. The Persian King Cyrus, after he had conquered Babylon, allowed those who wanted to, to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. There, the tribe of the Levites assumed control of the religion of Israel. During this time, the J, E, and D documents were brought together into one authoritative whole, and the final layer, P, was added. 
This priestly layer encoded the beliefs about Yahweh into a ceremonial form that commemorated the major events of Israel's religious history in festivals and sacrifices. The whole composition constituted between the first five and eight books of the Old Testament, scholars disagree somewhat on precisely how much Joshua, Judges, and Ruth were shaped by the JEDP documents. After this, these, uh, these critics suggest that the rest of the Old Testament was composed or was recovered from older religious writings and was expanded during the next few centuries. First, the books of the prophets were compiled. Certain parts of the prophets, like Isaiah 1 through 39, may have been pre-exilic, according to many critics, but they were not considered scripture until they were introduced into the canon after the Pentateuch was already completed. The prophetic books were produced alongside a theological interpretation of Israel's history since the time of Samuel, and that would be our books of 1 Samuel through 2 Kings. After the prophetic books were finished, a variety of other writings were introduced into the canon. These included the more philosophical and poetical books of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. This group also included historical writings that reflected a later date of composition, like Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and First and Second Chronicles. Consequently, this graph Wellhausen theory viewed the Jewish religion as the product of centuries of evolution, beginning at polytheism and ending at refined monotheism, ripe for the establishment of Christianity. The historical realities described in the Old Testament were simply ideological interpretations of the past, but Wellhausen argued they need not be seen as accurate histories. The literature that was adopted by the Jews as their holy books was layered, beginning with primitive beliefs and moving toward clarification and specification. Some of the critics who drove the development of this theory were unbelievers who wanted to see the faith of others shipwrecked, and these theories became powerful tools in these men's hands. If the Bible was not written under the direct supervision of God's Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, how could it be trusted as the revelation of God's will? However, the majority of these scholars, both Graf and Wellhausen included, saw themselves as reformers in the tradition of Martin Luther and John Calvin. They believed in God's existence, and they believed that he had influenced the history of the world, and they believed that Christians must seek him through the Bible. But they did not believe that the Bible was the verbatim word of God. This perspective, they believed, that the Bible was the literal word of God, was a construction of the Catholic Church, and just like Martin Luther and John Calvin, they believed that they were freeing evangelical Christianity from the burden of the Catholic Church and allowing their followers to live by faith alone with a more dynamic relationship with the Bible. They didn't believe that they were harming Christianity with their work. And Christianity should not be bothered by the polytheistic past of Israel. In fact, they believed it rather enhanced the significance of Christianity as the most refined form of the Israelite religion, the end point in a long evolutionary process. Now, the predominance of this theory was upset in the 20th century by an explosion of archaeological discoveries spearheaded by William F. Albright. Albright himself believed the form of this theory but the light his discoveries shed on the history of Israel before the Babylonian exile stripped away all of the historical presuppositions that Wellhausen worked with, including the suppositions that Israel was polytheistic until the reign of Josiah, and several of the indications that Wellhausen uh, uh, believed existed regarding the evolutionary development of the Israelite religion. So all that remained of the Graf Wellhausen theory at the end was the identity of these four documents. Now, a significant faction in modern biblical scholarship does remain convinced that the Old Testament is best described by these four documents, the JEDP documents. Although their reconstructions of the history of Israel differ somewhat from the reconstruction that Wellhausen offered because of the sheer weight of evidence from archeological discoveries.
This perspective on the structure of the Old Testament is particularly common in the literature that deals with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So how shall we react to this belief when we come across it? We shouldn't simply ignore it, primarily because there are professed Christians who are, according to their own testimony, seeking the truth of God's word, but they are convinced by this argument that their, their conception of Christianity is distorted as a result. Our desire to help them should compel us to understand how to talk them through this line of reasoning. And in order to do this, it will be helpful to understand the fundamental basis of this argument, which goes all the way back to Jean Astruc and the critics that he was dealing with. The division between documentary sources is made entirely on the basis of literary criteria. This means that critical scholars have identified certain words, phrases, names, or stylistic marks that predominantly occur in certain sections of the Pentateuch, while the other sections are marked by other words, phrases, names, and stylistic choices. Now, pointing these out can make for very impressive and convincing sounding arguments that can leave the reader or hearer wondering that anyone ever thought that the Pentateuch was written by only one author. But in application, this winds up being, yeah, becoming a very subjective process based on the individual judgment of each scholar, and it can be very misleading at worst. We'll look at a, a case study shortly on the subjectivity of judgment, but first we'll, we'll, we'll take a, a brief look at an example cited by William Henry Green in his book, The Unity of the Book of, of Genesis, pointing toward a misleading argument of this type. Green noted that August Dillman, a well-known critical theorist of the late 19th century, had pointed to the Hebrew word translated as form, as in God formed man or formed the animals of the dust of the earth. In Genesis chapter two, verse seven and two nineteen. he pointed to this word as evidence that Genesis one was written by a different author than Genesis two. The substance of his argument was this. This word, form, only ever occurs in J documents in the entire Hexateuch. And by the Hexateuch, he meant Genesis through Joshua. No E, D, or P documents ever use this word or seem to even know that it exists. Therefore, we can recognize the presence of a J document in part by the presence or the absence of this word. However, this argument loses its strength entirely when the reader realizes, as Green did, that this word doesn't occur in any other parts of the Hexateuch. The theoretical J documents don't use this word any more than E, D, or P, but the only uses of the word in the entire uh, Old Testament before the book of Isaiah, I believe, is here in Gen Genesis 2. You can't make a, a strong case based on a word that's only used in one passage. And yet Dillman and others have, have made strong sounding arguments like this, saying that we know this word only occurs in J documents and in no others. So th these arguments can be very misleading. Regarding the uh, difficulty of the, uh, of the archeological discoveries of the 20th century, the Wellhausen theory was in need of revision, and that leads to the second major theory that we'll look at before we, we look into our case study on the subjectivity of these theories. And the second theory is called the history of tradition theory. And this was, uh, this was spearheaded by a series of German scholars led by Hermann Gunkel. These scholars recognized the shortcomings of the literary critical methods of their predecessors, they recognized that these words, as Green recognized, could not uh, act as an objective criteria to divide these uh, books into individual documents. And so they needed some other theory or some other explanation in, or, in order to sustain the field of higher criticism. Let's see. A new theory was badly needed in order to uh, preserve the entire field of higher criticism. Gunkel put forward the suggestion that the books of the Old Testament were the results of centuries of oral transmission. He taught that the spiritual consciousness of the children of Israel had been developed through the process of storytelling, 
whereby individual performers would recall mythologized versions of the great heroes and events of Israel's past. These oral sagas would have developed as they passed from one performer to another. And as these performers reacted to developments in their social environment and even the subjective tastes of their audiences. For example, during a period of apostasy from the worship of Yahweh and increased polytheism, Gunkel might have expected the nation's storytellers to emphasize and develop stories of Yahweh's might and of his jealousy, with a special emphasis on cautionary tales that warned the people about their punishment if they wandered away from, from God. After these stories were told and developed for centuries, Gunkel believed that they were written down piecemeal. Now, once they were written down, this crystallized their growth and they were locked into a canonical form. Once the traditions regarding Moses, for example, were written, the storytellers were no longer free to change or to expand what had been written. Thus, the biblical documents themselves were written to be the authoritative word of God, usually by just one author. Um, and that, that clarified some of these literary criteria to Gunkel. Now, by studying this crystallized form and trying to understand what he called the Sitz im Leben des Volkes, which is a, a German phrase referring to the social situation uh, that led to the composition of each of the written works, that has led to the, the, the movement between the storytellers and the scribes, Gunkel believed that he could recover the original spoken versions of these traditions. For example, if he could deduce when, where, and why the book of Genesis was written down, he believed that he could discover the layers of tradition and socio-political influences that gave the Jewish religion its mature form in the book of Genesis. This approach allowed him to say that one person wrote Genesis without denying the various traditions that the higher critics before him had identified. The primary difference is that the vocabulary and the style of the final book may all belong to one author. Google did not identify sources by literary analysis. Rather, he tried to identify the different ideas or ideologies that went into the development of the book. Now, this is not to say that Gunko believed only one author wrote each, every book of the Old Testament. Many of them he believed were, but he still taught that they went through a process of literary growth. But this allowed him flexibility and identification of these traditions. It no longer upset his idea of a Jehovistic or an Elohistic section of the scripture if the vocabulary and the style did not line up with other sections he believed came from the same source. The verbiage did not matter, only the traditions that stood behind it. Ultimately, however, Gunkel's methodology falters in the same way as his predecessors. Every observation that Gunkel could make was subjective, and it depended on his personal judgment. He could not point to any piece or any combination of evidence that conclusively identified the Jehovistic stream of tradition and its influences on the Bible. Rather, he could offer at best what he thought were plausible arguments based on possible reconstructions of Israelite history. And this is where J.A. Klein's case study comes in, which he called New Directions in Poo Studies. Now in this article, J.A. Kleins took the same methodology that had been used by the uh, literary critical scholars of the Graf-Bellhausen theory and by Gunkel in his History of Tradition Theory, and he applied it to what he called the Poo Corpus, which consisted of the books Winnie the Pooh and The House at Pooh Corner. Now, we don't intend to dig too far into Klein's study. It's a full-length journal article. But it is enough to note that, aside from a few tongue-in-cheek jabs at the, the field of higher criticism, he makes good and effective use of their literary critical methods to argue for multiple authorship of the Pooh corpus. For example, he identifies several documentary sources on the basis of Pooh's names, which are listed on the screen there. Uh, Pooh is called variously Pooh. Winnie the Pooh, Bear, Edward Bear, Winnie the Pooh, Pooh Bear, 
P. Bear, Sir Puda Bear, and Sanders. Using these and other points of variation throughout the books, Kleins developed the idea that Winnie the Pooh was in fact drawn from a wide variety of documents and traditions that were stitched together by a final editor. These documentary sources disagreed with each other in terminology and nomenclature and characterizations. That is, some sources have a high view of Pooh, calling him a brave and clever bear, while others have a low view of him, calling him a bear of little brain. Kleins even went so far as to discover undertones of a polytheistic cultus in the ritual actions that happened in Pooh's life. And this is where he brought in Gunkel's theories and tried to identify the Zitz im Leben, uh, in which the, uh, the, the Pooh books were written and tried to identify the influence that led to the crystallization of these traditions. Now it's evident to all of us that this characterization of Winnie the Pooh is ridiculous. And it's obvious to each of us that reads Klein's article that he's reading much more in between the lines of what, uh, what's said in these books than is really there. However, that is exactly the point that Klein's is trying to make. Yes, every, or, uh, different parts of the Pentateuch use different names for God. And in fact, these names are frequently used together in close proximity with each other. And Moses does use somewhat different vocabulary when, for example, he describes the life of Abraham as opposed to when he describes the dietary, uh, dietary laws in the book of Leviticus. These facts, however, are not sufficient evidence to argue that several different people wrote these different sections. These kinds of observations can no more prove that Moses did not write the Pentateuch than the same observations about Winnie the Pooh can pr prove that their author, A. A. Milne, was a myth. The assured results of criticism rest entirely on the subjective judgment of literary analysis. Now, further developments have been made in the field since Gunkel's uh, introduction of his theory on both sides of the, the issue, both for and against the higher critical theories. Although Gunkel's work was influential, neither he nor any scholar since him has commanded the same authority in the field that Wellhausen did. Some authors, such as H.H. H. Rowley, followed largely in the footsteps of Wellhausen and S.R. Driver, while others, such as Gerhard von Rad, uh, S.H. Hook, the Uppsala School of Sweden, and others continue to push the theories in different directions in attempts to satisfy the criticisms brought against the critical theories in general. Just as there was little agreement between the German critics before Wellhausen's unifying influence appeared, there is no unifying critical theory of the modern day. However, there is a unifying sense that the critical method has been successful. In the words of Brevard Childs, one of the hallmarks of modern study of the Bible, which is one of the important legacies of the Enlightenment, is the recognition of the time-conditioned quality of both the form and content of scripture, a pre-critical method which could feel free simply to translate every statement of the Bible into a principle of right doctrine is no longer possible." End quote. Now, contrary to Child's strong assertion, there have been serious scholars throughout history who have opposed the ideas of higher criticism. Before Wellhausen, there was a group of scholars in Germany headed by E.W. Hengstenberg, and these scholars labored tirelessly to review and to respond to every new theory that was developed during that time period. During the same time, uh, C.F. Kiel and Franz de Litch collaborated on an Old Testament commentary set that made a strong, well-supported case for the authenticity and the unity of Hebrew scriptures. When the higher critical theories broke into the English-speaking world, they were met, or they were not met without opposition, excuse me, without opposition. William Henry Green, who we noted earlier, and J.W. McGarvey produced a substantial number of works responding to the the publications of S.R. Driver, 
and many of the translated works of German scholars like Dillmann. This work was continued into the 20th century by Umberto Casuto, who was a uh, Jewish scholar who believed in the unity of the Pentateuch, and then by Oswald T. Alice and Edward J. Young, who were Presbyterian scholars and brought uh, their, their studies, their abilities to bear against the higher critics of Gunkel's day. In more recent years, literature that deals directly with the critical theories and methods used for them has been produced by Gleason Archer, whose survey of Old Testament introduction is excellent. And uh, in, in a more piecemeal fashion, Richard Hess and James E. Smith have been responding to uh, the, the claims of higher criticism in their commentaries and several monographs throughout the years. Smith in particular has produced voluminous works covering a wide variety of subjects across both the Old Testament and the New Testament, but all of his works share a high view of the inspiration of the Bible. Uh, of the Bible. All of these scholars are well aware of the evidence used by higher critics uh, in order to support their critical theories. And together, they all make a strong case for the inspiration of the authenticity of the Bible, despite the strong and often overbearing arguments of their opponents. To circle back to one of our earliest points, it's not accurate to characterize the work of these scholars uh, as pre-critical, using the, the terminology of Brevard Childs there. They are neither unaware of the assured results of criticism, nor do they reject the critical method of study. They represent a school of study that has subjected the Old Testament to rigid analysis according to the best evidence available, and they've found that the scripture's claims of unity and authenticity are well-founded in reason and evidence. However, since about the 1950s, there have been a handful of scholars who have towed the line between the critical perspective and a more conservative analysis of the evidence. R.K. Harrison was an excellent scholar whose grasp of the archaeological, anthropological, philosophical, and historical evidence that impacted the field of Old Testament study was largely unparalleled in his day. He deals with all of the critical arguments he was aware of in his nearly 1300 page introduction to the Old Testament, in which he makes a strong case for the substantial mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, the accuracy of the Old Testament's chronology and historical descriptions of Israel and other kingdoms, and the unity of the religion of Israel throughout its history. Although, of course, he allows for the frequent apostasy and polytheism that was practiced by the people of Israel which we can see throughout the historical books of scripture. However, Harrison allows certain parts of the scripture to be mythologized, such as the history of the world from creation through the flood in Genesis chapters one through 11. Harrison instead believes that humanity evolved, at least culturally, over an extended period of time measured in thousands of years, beginning as cavemen and culminating in the development of Mesopotamian civilization. The traditions of God's creative week, the Garden of Eden, and the Flood were all oral sagas passed down to Moses in the manner that Gunkel described, according to Harrison's analysis. Consequently, he believed that the Old Testament was accurate and unified insofar as its human authors knew. It did not trouble Harrison to assign limits to God's inspiration as a result of the higher critical theories that he had studied. Of a similar nature is the book Old Testament Survey by William Lesor, David Hubbard, and Frederick Bush. These authors have a much lower view of the Bible than Harrison did, believing with the higher critics that these books were pieced together and embellished during the last few centuries before Christ. However, they agree with Harrison and with other conservative scholars mentioned previously on their conception of Israelite history and the development of Israelite religion. Harrison, Lesor, Hubbard, and Bush are all agreed that the Hebrew Bible represents an accurate history of the nation that produced it, but they have a relatively low view of God's inspiration when it comes to the composition of the texts themselves. They are convinced by the higher critical arguments that have to do with the form of scripture, or at least by some of them, 
but they are unconvinced by the critical arguments that attack the authority and accuracy of scripture. Their publications may be of some careful use for serious Bible students, although they, uh, because although they do not share our perspective of the Bible, they will offer a good cultural, historical, and archeological argument to support the historicity of the scriptures. On the opposite side, so the, these scholars have been uh, developed a good and conservative view of the history of Israel, and then they, they read into that, or, or that forces them to have a high view of scripture to a certain degree, but they did not start with a high view of scripture, they started with a high view of history. On the opposite side, there is a school of, his, or a school of thought that has a low view of the historicity or the, the history behind the Old Testament, but they have a high view of the final form of the Bible. These are scholars and thinkers who have wholeheartedly accepted the conclusions of higher critical research, but still want to believe in God's revelatory work through the children of Israel. Brevard Child's work is representative of this line of thought, and most who advocate something similar to it pay homage to him as the originator of this school. This is called the canonical approach to Old Testament study, and you might see it in uh, child's books in the works of Walter Brueggemann and throughout the modern biblical theology movement. The canonical approach begins with a total acceptance of critical theories. It does not matter whether the documentary hypothesis or the form critical hypothesis is the starting point, whether we follow Gunkel or Wellhausen. What matters is that the practitioners of the canonical approach see the Old Testament as a haphazard collection of contradictory compositions. The history of Israel is unknown. Certain suppositions can be made, often according to the history of tradition school of thought, but the historical perspective given in the Old Testament itself cannot be true if the canonical interpretation is going to work. Instead, the myths, the sagas, and legal traditions of the Hebrew Bible are seen as shifting and growing, exerting an influence on each other while remaining separate entities until a community of faith collected them together, thus canonizing them. Walter Brueggemann and Todd Linnefelt in their introduction to the Old Testament suggest that the process of canonization was organic in nature. That is, that it was not a process of debate or authoritative councils deciding which books were going to be in the Bible and which, which ones weren't. Rather, they proposed that individual synagogues, families, and other communities of faith use the written traditions passed down by previous generations for education and devotion in their religious rituals. Over time, they say, as the sociopolitical situation in Israel changed and communities of faith continued to use and circulate different written traditions, each group developed a list of favorites that they kept coming back to time and time again, and they continued to reinterpret each book for each new generation. At some point, all of the communities of faith in Israel more or less settled on the same list of books in the same form. Perhaps this was the decision of a council after years and years of this process, or perhaps it was through the influence of particularly prominent communities. And then at this point, the list became the canonical scripture of Judaism. Now, according to this view, the inspiration of God and the composition of the scriptures was not a result of God's direct involvement with the authors of scripture. Rather, God is seen as working through the decisions of these communities of faith. Therefore, God is not to be found in the scriptures themselves, but rather in the process of trying to find him in the scriptures. The scriptures, they, these uh, scholars argue, were produced by human flaws uh, who were conducting a similar search for God in their own environments. God made himself known because he was being sought and he made himself known through the Old Testament because that was the tool that Israel was trying to use to find him. The canonical approach to the Old Testament embraces this idea in its totality. Truths about God cannot be found in scripture as propositional truths, that is, 
we cannot know that God loves humanity or hates sin simply because the Bible says so. The Bible in this view says many things that are false or are unverifiable. So we can't know anything simply by studying a particular passage. Instead, Childs insists, we must read the Old Testament as a whole. The process of canonization, he teaches, has recontextualized all of these different contradictory writings into a single unit. There is unity in the Hebrew scriptures because the canon made them unified. The mere existence of the canon challenges all interpreters to wrestle with the contradictions and falsehoods and missteps in the Old Testament in order to discover who God really is in relation to communities of faith today. In the words of H. Gamble, who is quoted in Stephen Dempster's Dominion and Dynasty, in the nature of the case, canonization entails a recontextualization of the documents incorporated into the canon. They are abstracted from both their generative and traditional settings and redeployed as parts of a new literary whole. Henceforth, they are read in terms of this collection. In this way, their historically secondary context becomes their hermeneutically primary context. More important still, the canon creates a presumption of unity and coherence among its contents and inevitably encourages a synoptic reading of them. Thus, the canon operates to refocus the meaning of individual documents as each is read with a view to others and in the light of the collection as a whole. Fundamentally, the canonical approach to the Old Testament argues that the process of canonization made the books of the Old Testament into something that they were not before. The form of the content did not change, but the meaning of the content did when it was forced into the context of the rest of the canon. Childs offers the example of the book of Joshua. This book, he claims, originally lauded war and violence as something that glorified God. However, he says, when it was placed into the same context as the commandment, you shall not kill, as well as stories such as David's murder of Uriah the Hittite and other clear denunciations against wanton violence, it could no longer mean the same thing. Child's resolution to, uh, resolution to that particular problem was that the actions taken in the book of Joshua were justified when they happened, but that they must be seen as the actions of long ago by someone who had read the rest of the Old Testament to whom it was no longer acceptable to carry out such theologically motivated violence. This canonical methodology allows for new and different interpretations of God's role in human history and salvation. If the correct way for an individual or for a community of faith to come to know God rests on their ability to recognize and wrestle with the points of tension in the canonical scriptures, for example, God's desire to save versus his wrath against sin, and to find God somewhere in the middle, then there is room for different denominations and different generations within a single denomination to find very different answers to their questions. Walter Bergerman and Todd Linnefeld in particular are conscious of this fact and welcome it into their interpretational approach. Quote, it is that interplay of the three, that is imagination, ideology, and inspiration, that requires that the text must always again be interpreted. The traditioning process, for that reason, cannot ever be concluded because the text is endlessly needful of new rendering. So this canonical approach to scripture, championed by Brevard Childs and those who follow him, totally rejects the idea that the text has any meaning in itself. Instead, the whole meaning of the text can only be found in the interpreter's relationship with it. The true meaning of the Hebrew scriptures can never be given. The best interpretation can only apply to a particular group at a particular time. This ideology takes the canonical authority of God's word away from the scripture and gives it to those interpreters who decide what God's word is and what it says. For this reason, we must totally reject child's canonical approach if we have any aspirations toward Christian unity, which is a clear desire of God's, John 17, 22 and 23, and Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. Or, if we have any desire to know the truth, John 8, 32.
the Bible that Childs believes that he is reading is totally irreconcilable with the Bible that we are reading. So how shall we respond to this canonical reading of scripture? The answer lies in our concept of canon. To borrow a conception used by Daniel Wallace in reference to the New Testament, is the canon an authoritative list of books or is it a list of authoritative books? The difference between the two may not seem to be that great at first glance because both result in a canonical authoritative collection. However, if we say that the authority of the collection comes from the process of canonization itself, we actually undermine the authority, the authenticity, and the integrity of each of the writings that makes up the canon. By contrast, the apostles taught that every part of the Old Testament was the word of God the moment that it was written before the canon was complete. Consider 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, uh, and the New King James says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This literal translation allows for a certain degree of ambiguity. That is, we can ask whether Peter is telling his readers not to interpret the prophecies of scriptures for themselves, or if he is teaching that the prophet's private thoughts had no role in the composition of his prophecy. Verse 21 makes the latter interpretation more likely, since he went on to stress that the will of man did not produce prophecy. Toward this end, it may be helpful to consider the paraphrase of verse 20 in the NIV. It says, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. When we adopt this apostolic understanding of God's revelation, we will read the Hebrew Bible very differently from the methods that we have just studied. Every part of scripture is the word of God, and every part is equally true. We are not looking to rec reconcile unresolvable tension between different narratives and commands, nor are we looking to discover God in a human production. Rather, we believe that God has made truth known through his word and that we can know that truth today through careful study. So as our, our very concluding statement, when we find ourselves confronted with the fact that more than 200 years of serious respected scholarship has recognized and assured us of the human failings of the Bible, we must simply remember that more than 200 years of research built on a faulty premise is still built on a faulty premise, no matter how long it's been perpetuated. All of the criteria proposed for the division of the Bible into component documents or traditions or layers of editorship are ultimately subjective and based on the judge, personal judgment of the researcher. Just like Klein's work with Winnie the Pooh, all of these methods can be applied to any book with similar results. Therefore, the arguments simply are not convincing and better interpretations of the historical evidence that account for the unity and authenticity of the Bible do exist.